guys, it's Jiha. So I recently made a video criticizing the first two episodes of Demon Slayer, and I've never had such a polarized response on a video before. What's really interesting though is based on the comments, most of the people who disagreed with me were saying the same thing. Their major complaint isn't necessarily that what I said about the first two episodes was incorrect, but that the idea itself of judging a show based on the first two episodes is ludicrous which was kind of a surprise for me, considering that I usually judge an entire show based on just one episode. And I can understand why that might sound harsh, especially if I'm criticizing a really popular show that people love, but the simple fact is that there is a high probability that problems that appear in the first episode of any given show will continue as it goes on. You might be thinking authors improve over time, which is true, but that trend that I mentioned still happens. Why? Think about it. Creative writers are taught to focus a lot on the first chapter, first paragraph, because they know that that is what readers are going to look at first. I try my best to make especially the beginning engaging and thought-provoking because I am constantly keeping in mind that if I am not engaging and thought-provoking in the beginning of a comic or novel or essay or whatever I'm writing, readers are going to get bored and leave. The beginning isn't the most important part of any given piece of writing, but it should get special focus as the part that needs to establish readers' interest and prove your credibility as a storyteller. If you don't prove quickly to readers that you have the skills to keep them engaged, why should they continue reading through to the middle or to the end? The fact that the work is packaged into episodes means that the writer should take into account the break between the episodes. That break is an opportunity for watchers to click away, start watching something else, and leave their story behind. So from a marketing standpoint, any creators of a show should know that the first episode is critical for creating at least some emotional investment in the show. So a lot of attention and care should go into crafting the first episode. It should be representative of the author's writing chops. So if a first episode is clumsy or poorly written, it tells me that the author doesn't understand his or her craft well enough yet to keep me engaged going forward. And when there are thousands of new books, comics, manga, anime, short stories, poems, movies, TV shows coming out literally all the time, why would I want to spend my time watching a long-running shonen anime while having to wait for the author to improve before I'll enjoy it? Instead, I'll find someone who already has a level of writing skill that entertains me from the beginning and read or watch that. Yes, I know I'm extremely critical. And I totally understand that some people don't have as harsh a standard as I do, and there's nothing wrong with being kinder about judging the media you consume. In fact, I think it's compassionate to think, hey, someone worked really hard on this, I should give it a bigger chance to entertain me. If that's you, power to you, my dude. But it's not me. That aside, if you do want to get pickier about what shows you continue, perhaps in the interest of saving your own time or sharpening your critical eye, Next, I'll explain what I'm actually looking for when I watch the first episode of any anime or TV show. 1. Efficient, tidy dialogue without info dumping. 2. At least one, quote, interesting character, preferably the protagonist. I'll explain what I mean about that in a bit. 3. Consistency within its own narrative. And 4. Racism, sexism, etc. Now, obviously, these things can be somewhat subjective as well, so let me explain what I mean one by one. First, efficient dialogue. I don't mean that dialogue is short, I mean that it is multi-purpose. There should be more to it than its literal meaning. It has to show, leave room for inference instead of force-feeding information to the viewer. For example, say there is a group of children bullying a smaller child. They push him against a wall and their leader says, where's the sacrilege now? The victim replies, you beat me because you know I'm right and you can't prove me wrong. There are a lot of layers to this conversation, despite there only being two lines. The first one, where's the sacrilege now? A child wouldn't know the word sacrilege, most likely, unless he heard it from the adults in their society. Therefore, whatever the victim believes in is not widely accepted in their society, to the point that even children have picked up on the adult's word for the victim's beliefs. His beliefs are then probably openly mocked by people in authority, presumably some sort of religious authority if sacrilege is the word that they use. Additionally, they're pointedly not teasing the younger child based on the standard things that bullies pick on in the real world. Appearance, size, intelligence, socioeconomic status. So it's implied that this sacrilegious belief that the victim has is seen as even worse among the children's social hierarchy than any of the usual stuff. 
The victim's response, you beat me because you know I'm right and you can't prove me wrong, characterizes him in a single line. He's unable to defend himself physically, but is still unwilling to renounce his beliefs or allow the bullies to have the satisfaction of thinking they've won just because they've physically triumphed. It also shows a psychological understanding of his peers that is very mature for his age. So from two lines here, we've gotten that the victim is strongly attached to his beliefs and highly intelligent, and that his beliefs are persecuted in his society, probably by the general population and enforced by some kind of religious authority. These lines are from the first chapter of Attack on Titan, where Armin is being confronted by bullies for wanting to explore the outside world. And guess what? Everything we inferred just now, we later find out is correct. Armin is staunch in sticking by his ideals and the smartest character in the cast, and Wallace enforced the idea that it is wrong to explore beyond the walls. So this is the kind of dialogue I'm looking for. It's efficient in that despite not taking up that much time or space, it communicates a ton of information to the readers without spelling it straight out either. This is engaging because viewers have to actively make inferences to solve a sort of puzzle. Now, it would be way too much if all of the dialogue in any given work was multifaceted like this, but what I search for in the first episode are at least a few instances of this kind of dialogue. It signals to me that the author is skilled at their craft to be able to show rather than tell, and also that the author trusts the audience to be intelligent enough to read between the lines. That builds their credibility as an author. So if I notice this kind of dialogue sprinkled through this first episode, I might continue on. A type of dialogue that is a huge red flag is info dumping. Usually in the novelist community, we associate info dumping with paragraphs of text rather than dialogue, but it can happen in dialogue too. For example, say there are two siblings who live alone and they're eating breakfast on an ordinary school morning. Somehow, in passing conversation to each other with no one else present, they mention each other's ages, that their parents are dead, and how long ago that was. That is info dumping. It is unnatural. Or, for another example, say the protagonist is new in town and has a guard randomly explain to him that he is in the capital where the emperor lives, even though that is obvious since the protagonist went there on purpose, and said protagonist still acts surprised. And then the guard goes on to explain to this immigrant how the government works, even though he should know already since he chose to go there, including how the king is a puppet monarch and not actually in charge, and that dissenters are endangering themselves to the point that you can't even say the name of the true emperor at a normal volume in public. The protagonist responds by angrily saying that this true monarch is the one who put heavy taxes on his village, despite not being upset or blaming the emperor prior to knowing that he was a puppet. In fact, he was way too excited to find out that the emperor lived in the center of the capital. The author wants us to know some piece of information, but was unable to smoothly integrate it into the story. This either means that they don't have the skills yet to be subtle, natural, or patient, or it means that they purposely info dump because they don't trust the audience is smart enough to pick up on a less obvious cue. So if I see a really blatant example of this type of dialogue, or if it happens too often in small ways, then for me it detracts from the chance that I'll continue the show. Next, what makes a quote, interesting character? Obviously very subjective, there are characters that I love that someone else might hate, and vice versa. Generally though, there are a few rules of thumb that I look for. The protagonist needs a flaw that gets in the way of their goal. Is the character too perfect? Because honestly, that's one of the quickest and easiest telltale signs of a novice writer. It's simply the truth. In modern age storytelling, if the protagonist is too perfect, it probably means that the writer isn't that seasoned yet. But why do we want character flaws in the first place? So a story with human characters but no internal conflict is not interesting to me because I won't be invested in characters with no internal life. And the way to create interesting internal conflict within a character is through character flaws. Without a character flaw, all their problems will be external, and does that seem like a human situation? Like often it's our own flaws of personality that prevent us from achieving our goals or moving forward in life and watching characters confront their flaws and overcome them is interesting, cathartic, and inspiring. Or watching the common tropes about overcoming their flaws being subverted, equally interesting. But a perfect protagonist won't be forced to confront his own personality flaws at any point in the future because he doesn't have any. One common example, and the one that happens to play Demon Slayer, is the quote character flaw that's actually a good thing. Being too loyal, too determined, too kind, these types of things are commonly used as main character flaws, but the issue with this is twofold. Firstly, characters are generally supposed to face and overcome their character flaws as the story goes on, right? So if they have to face and overcome their flaw of being too much of a good thing, 
it often creates unintended messages for the story, such as that that good quality is actually bad, or in the case of shonen anime that are trying to be positive and or lighthearted, often they make it look like they're saying that the world is cruel and therefore being too much of a good thing only makes you suffer. For example, if the protagonist is too kind, then in order to quote, overcome this flaw, they may end up becoming cruel towards enemies instead of kind, which implies that having compassion for suffering in general is an impediment to your personal success in our harsh and violent world. Which is often not what they meant to say, but they often end up saying things they didn't mean to say when they use to insert good quality as a primary character flaw that needs overcoming. That's issue number one. On the other hand, perhaps the protagonist is so much of this good thing that it doesn't actually end up being an obstacle with consequences, but actually helps them achieve their goal. This could work if they have some other prominent character flaw that actually hinders them, since that is the whole point of character flaws, but otherwise it just reinforces that they actually had no flaw in the first place. For example, if being too determined was actually the right thing to do because it all worked out with the sheer brute force of effort, then being too determined wasn't really a flaw in the first place, according to the narrative. It might have been a source of external conflict between the characters who thought it was a flaw and the protagonist who has the quality, but the protagonist was never actually at fault, and never actually had a flaw. That circles back to a lack of meaningful internal conflict. Issue number two. So if I see a protagonist without a real useful character flaw that I want to see them overcome, then I leave. Another sign of amateur writing is when every side character loves the protagonist for no apparent or valid reason, and or if there is a character who does hate the protagonist, then they are portrayed as in the wrong. Other than being slightly annoying, the issue with this kind of writing is that the protagonist doesn't end up with any negative consequences for their actions. They shouldn't be able to get away with anything and everything just because that's how awesome they are, because that's not how life works. Maybe a work made mostly for wish fulfillment fantasies could succeed with this kind of thing, but that's not what I'm looking for, personally. The protagonist has to have a personal flaw, and that flaw has to actually get in the way of them achieving their goal, and other people have to actually react negatively to their behavior in a way that causes the protagonist problems. The second common issue with character that will make me leave a show are overly archetypal characters. If they're closely following a certain character archetype, there has to be at least one thing that is unique about them that makes them different, usually that flaw we were talking about. If the trope is really overdone, I'll be looking for a subversion. For example, if the protagonist is your typical old school shonen protagonist, I'm talking hot-headed, loud, hyper characters like Naruto, Dankuso, Asta, etc., then there should be something extra that's compelling about them. Back when Naruto is at its best, Naruto is an underdog who wants to be loved, but he's held back by both his lack of skill and his annoying personality. The personal flaw part is key. If the only thing the protagonist lacks is skill, it's not interesting to watch them grow. We enjoy watching Naruto grow at first because it's not just his lack of skill he's overcoming, but he's also maturing from an obnoxious kid into a considerate man who can accept others rather than pining for others to accept him. Um, sort of a side note, there's a lot of talk about quote, likable characters in the writing community, but for me, they don't have to be particularly likable or relatable. I mean, they have to be likable enough that I'm not in pain watching them, but to me, it's more important that they have flaws that will create internal conflict later in the story. So if the protagonist just seems way too perfect and well-liked through the entire first episode, it throws up a bit of a red flag for me. Now on to consistency within its own narrative. If you set up world-building rules and manage to contradict them without explanation in the first episode, that's not a good sign. Let's look at Dr. Stone and Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood as examples. Both claim that something that is not science actually is science, but only one of them managed to keep what is science and what is not consistent. Obviously, the consistent one is Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. Alchemy in our world is not science. In our world, it is considered a pseudoscience. However, in Full Metal Alchemist, alchemy is their science, and obviously deviates from what historical alchemy was. So right away, the use of the word alchemy being equated with science alerts us that their science is not exactly like our science, and we shouldn't expect that. At the same time, there are rules for their science established right away too, like the Law of Equivalent Exchange, and it stays consistent throughout the show. Then we have Dr. Stone, which starts off in our world in an ordinary high school, 
our protagonist being a boy genius scientist with the worst hair I've ever seen. He's clearly a science prodigy, but there is no indication that his science differs from real science in our world. His chemistry seems to be the same as our chemistry. But then they throw us this huge ass curveball because suddenly events that should drive a science prodigy mad trying to explain it are supposed to be all explainable through science. The characters live for 800 years. Might we add that they were also without food or water, totally conscious without going insane in total darkness, unable to move, and suffered zero muscle atrophy during that time. But our science prodigy doesn't find this suspicious at all and is totally not worried that all the tenets of biology have just been violated. He just wants to know what caused it, not how the frick they became superhuman immortals. At the same time, we're supposed to believe that he used pure science to figure out how to crack the stone using real chemistry. So are you or are you not obeying the real scientific discoveries that we've made in the real world? In Full Metal Alchemist, it's immediately obvious that it's not supposed to take place in our real world. But in Dr. Stone, they imply that it takes place in the real world and then poop all over that idea while still expecting us to suspend our disbelief that Bad Hair Day is a scientist as we understand the word. Be consistent within your own narrative. If the author contradicts their own world building so early on as the first episode, then chances are they don't have a strong enough command of their craft yet and will do it again. Originally, I was going to call this section political correctness, but it's not quite accurate. I'm not looking for a show that says African-American instead of black or Caucasian instead of white. I am looking for works that treat all humans as humans first before they're labeled as belonging to any one group. The most prominent characteristic of each character shouldn't be the gay one or the black guy. If they go out of their way to make it clear that the Asian character is good at math or kung fu but can't drive, then I'm immediately gone. That goes for gender too. Are the female characters portrayed as weak just because they're female, or are they just eye candy without significant personalities? Is the trans character just used as the butt of jokes? Most of the time, I don't think writers purposely include prejudice portrayals of different groups, but they often happen by accident due to unconscious biases absorbed from society at large. So not every instance of prejudice will make me immediately drop a show, but it's always important to be aware of it. And an important point is that characters can have prejudices without the entire work being prejudiced, depending on how that character's prejudice is portrayed. Does the narrative condone it or condemn it? Honestly, I could make a whole separate video on the types of things that I expect from media representation of minority groups, so let me know if you're interested in that, but for now, we'll move on in the interest of keeping this video significantly shorter. However, there is one thing that I will not judge about a work before I finish it, and that's its overall message or theme. Some people call this the quote lesson. Even if a work seems to be saying something at the very beginning, it's possible that the theme will later be challenged or complicated or even changed completely. Sometimes we don't even fully understand the messages of a work after intense study, which you can see when you read any literary journal full of conflicting opinions on a work all supported by different interpretations of the same textual evidence. And on the topic of different interpretations, what you guys look for in a quote good show might be different than what I look for. Like, I would say that I come in anime and other audiovisual media from more of a creative novelist perspective, mostly self-taught but not really because I learned a lot off the internet. So my perspective on what makes a creative work good is probably more in line with modern mainstream storytelling strategies and the American novel market. Like, notice I didn't say anything about cinematography or art style or score. Like, those things don't really factor into my enjoyment of a show as much. But a screenwriter might look for different things. An artist, a businessman, a high school student. Good is subjective. And before I go, I want to clarify one more thing. I'm not saying that people who have produced mediocre work in the past can't improve. One of the things I love about writing is that there's no ceiling. You can always get better at it, always work at it. So this video isn't meant as a jab at any of the people who've produced the work I don't necessarily like. Also, this isn't a jab at people who want to give shows more than one episode to entertain them. I'm the type of person that can't enjoy media to the fullest without analyzing it. For me, it's fun, obviously, otherwise why is this channel in existence? And that's why I eventually became critical to the point that I will judge the whole work based on the beginning, especially when it comes to works coming out in modern times, informed of and by our modern standards. So that's how I choose whether or not to continue a show based on one episode. I look for efficient dialogue, well-flawed characters, consistency within its own narrative, and humanity. I hope this has somewhat quelled the outrage over my subjectively premature judgment of Demon Slayer, and if not, I hope you at least understand what criteria underlie the formation of my opinion. 
Comment below how you decide which shows you want to continue. Thank you guys for watching, especially those of you who made it this far. Leave a thumb up if you enjoyed the video, and subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this from me, and I'll see you next time. Bye!